from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Protecting breakfast. Cereal crops represent about half of the food that we eat in our lives in terms of calories. How one university is helping to make sure what's in your morning bowl is safe. Building efficiency on the farm. There are no service points on this row unit, no greasers. Matter of fact, the whole machine at 40 feet only got 10 on it, so it's very simple when it comes to maintenance. We head back to this year's Agritechnica in Germany for technology that's working to make every turn count as a high-stakes meeting between the U.S. and China takes place. And we want agriculture trade to be real, really the foundation of that. The latest right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Michelle Rock coming to you from our Kansas City studios. Clinton is in Hanover, Germany, and we'll have a report from this year's Agritechnica coming up. But first, we want to bring you the latest on President Biden's meeting with the leader of our biggest ag buying country, China. The two leaders meeting in Silicon Valley on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum in San Francisco. Now, the last time President Biden spoke in person with Xi Jinping was a year ago in Bali. Mr. Biden saying ahead of the high-stakes summit, he hoped Wednesday's meeting would put the U.S.-China relationship on steadier footing. White House officials said they didn't expect a long list of outcomes. Instead, the primary objective appeared to be restoring channels of communication. We have a lot of issues that, of course, we're dealing with uh, on the military, on technologies of the future, advanced chips, all of that. And, and that's always going to be, I think, some tension in addition to Taiwan and other issues. But we still think that we have to keep a strong, we can keep a, a, a good trading relationship with China. And we want agriculture trade to be real, really the foundation of that. And tomorrow, President Biden is scheduled to meet with Mexican President Lopez Obrador on the sidelines of the APEX summit. While the meeting may not immediately address irregular migration, officials say it will pave the way for broader regional discussions on migration. It's been a challenging couple of years for the ag machinery industry, from supply chain issues to labor availability. But they're ultimately changing the way the industry talks about the future. That's what Ag Day's Clinton Griffiths is learning from Agritechnica in Hanover, Germany this week. Clinton? Here at Agritechnica, it's not about looking in the rear view. Instead, it's about looking forward. And companies are pushing forward, searching for ways to both innovate and create super efficient machines. Amid the hustle and hark, innovations cover every corner of Agritechnica. This is the eradicators behind the tractor. And display after display touts the importance of efficiency. So a couple of the other features on the row unit are, is number one, there are no service points on this row unit, no greasers. Matter of fact, the whole machine at 40 feet's only got 10 on it. So it's very simple when it comes to maintenance. And the tools are everywhere, from innovative concepts like the Nexat system. The way it works is we have a carrier vehicle where you put different implements for the different applications. You hang it under the carrier vehicle. It's because you have one machine, one, one time, let's say the motor, the hydraulics, everything, the cabin, um, for the different applications. So each application that you do becomes a self-propelled application. And that's quite a technical advantage because the weight of every implement is on the carrier vehicle. Two hybrid tractors powered by diesel with an electric front axle. Advantages with electrification is I have high torque available at low RPM and it's instant. There's smart farming and then there's artificial intelligence. Bayer now working on real answers to sorting mountains of farm data. Applying that technology to these large data sets and being able to find insights at the speed of a question is what I like to say, right? A simple conversational question that you might ask and it's going to give you an analysis or some results back. It lets everybody be functional when it comes to analyzing farm data. Data collected and data solutions in real time. And as the grain is running up the clean grain elevator, we always take a sample. We auger it through this bypass in front of the near infrared sensors light. And we measure in real time, for example, the protein content of your wheat, the starch content of your barley, or the oil content of your oilseed rape. 
in real time. The ideas are plentiful, but ultimately it's about adoption. Adoption rate's always hard because you're, you're, you're changing the way you do business, right? And the changing the way you, you operate. And it's a matter of, you know, part of it is being able to illustrate, here's what it really means to you, bottom line, dollars and cents, because uh, dollars and cents usually talk. It also means that there's a whole lot of communication, a whole lot of training that meets, needs to be done in a whole lot of levels. So often, adopting these new efficient tools boils down to money. How do we make sure that enough people are utilizing the tools so they can, in fact, be efficient, as efficient as they possibly can in the operation? From manufacturing to planting to harvest, we were running this machine absolutely up to its maximum with a 15 meter, 50 foot header. You were throwing a tray under this machine and there was no losses discernible behind the combine. Losses is lost grain, but it gives you a problem and it's lost money. For crops and for people. The autonomous system allows farmers to take this tractor out to their fields, get on their My Operations app, tell it to go, and then they can go leave and, and do something else. And so what we're hearing from customers is that, you know, whoever was driving that tractor before and doing that tillage, they're able to maybe go do more value added work on the farm somewhere else. As the industry pushes to eliminate the slack and make each and every turn count. In Hanover, Germany, I'm Clinton Griffiths reporting. Thanks so much, Clinton. A plan to avert a government shutdown and extend the current farm bill now has the approval of the U.S. House. New Republican Speaker Mike Johnson of Louisiana forced to reach across the aisle to Democrats when hard-right conservatives came out against his plan. The measure includes an extension of the 2018 farm bill through September of next year. Democratic Representative Mark Powcan of Wisconsin supporting it, warning that without the Farm Bill extension, milk prices would have soared and hurt producers back in his home state. Johnson's proposal to temporarily fund the government into the new year passed on a bipartisan tally, with 93 Republicans voting against it. But I was very disappointed that last second he added the Farm Bill and actually punted it till the next fiscal year, till October. Because this is a very important bill where we need to look how we can improve competition in farmers, as health of Americans, how we can help smaller farmers, and also how we can have Americans healthier and have better food. So I think we need to think about things like that. And I was very disappointed that we decided to punt this issue. The legislation sets up two funding deadlines. Agriculture, along with energy and water, and others would be funded through January 19th. The rest of the federal government would be funded until February 2nd. Yields in the Fields on Ag Day is brought to you by Micro Essentials, the super granule that packs balanced nutrition into a single granule for uniform nutrient distribution, increased nutrient uptake, and season-long sulfur availability. Beating commodity fertilizers every time. Supercharge your yields with the Mighty Micro from Mosaic. In some areas that have battled drought in the south are getting some much-needed moisture. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has a look. Yeah, we're talking about some rain uh, through the Gulf Coast states. Now, I want to look at the flooding potential map uh, on Thursday and on Friday. A slight difference as this uh, energy, this low pressure system works across the Gulf Coast and back up to the north and east, there is going to be a sliver of flooding potential on Thursday, about 5 to 15 percent uh, coming up for Florida. I think uh, the wettest uh, of the days are behind us, but much needed rainfall in and across Florida. You can see the rest of the map stays clear and also stays dry as we get into Thursday and Friday. Our next system starts to take shape with a cold front Friday, Saturday and Sunday across the United States. Go ahead, take a look at your screen here. A beautiful shot in Union, Michigan. You know, checking those yields in the fields. Jason Cloud of Union, Michigan, telling us he has finished up soybean harvest in the southwest part of the state. Jason says he was averaging about 58 bushels to the acre for the dryland crop. Looks like he's been able to take in some terrific sunsets as well. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Well, grains were under pressure on Wednesday in tandem with some bearish macro markets. I'll take a deeper dive in markets now next. And keeping cereals safe, a look at the latest research that's helping growers and eaters alike. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here.
Grains had a lower day on Wednesday. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing joining us. And John, you know, the pullback in corn and soybeans, did we just run up into some chart resistance and see profit taking? Or was it a little switch in maybe these Brazilian weather forecasts? I think it's a combination of the two that got the market to pull back yesterday. First off, again, just those resistance barriers are there, especially in corn. 480 seems to be just a wall over top December futures. We hit that yesterday and you could just see the sellers kick in. You know, we tried that number two days in a row and just didn't get through. So that kind of sends the path of least resistance back the other way. Same thing with soybeans. We did kind of break out, but ran into that $14 barrier. And that just seemed to hold things in check. And then you go look at the weather forecast. Again, maybe a little bit of moisture coming in, a little more friendly, even though some of the longer range views still look that way that could stay supportive here. Price might be just a window, especially with the holiday coming next week, that we see a little bit of money move out of that soybean market on some profit taking. And if the models do not confirm over the weekend on that South American forecast, is it possible we'll be able to get above that $14 mark in January beans? Yeah, I think it's very possible. Again, that weather premium will come right back in. The momentum is still pointing that way. You know, it's still an upward trending chart. I mean, we just kind of got to the top of the channel a little bit with the trade on Thursday. Uh, so again, we'll have to just kind of watch how that comes, in, comes into play um, as we move forward. Uh, we faded the NOPA crush number. It was a record. Was that kind of already priced into the soybean market, you think? I think it was, you know, it was no secret that a big number was coming. And again, with that crush number that came out, you know, just reflection of what the domestic demand is. And that's still one of the reasons that we see good support in bean prices here, too, because U.S. supplies are still relatively tight and those margins are there, especially with the price of soybean meal where it is. Those crushers are looking to keep bidding into the marketplace. Yeah. And what about the influence of, you know, outside macro markets or even the meeting between uh, China and the U.S.? You know, that may have been a little bit of a factor on prices yesterday as well, that buy the rumor, sell the fact mentality may have kicked in there on Wednesday. Just with the fear of fact, again, we're waiting for something. We're hoping maybe we get some, you know, feel good sale or on beans and or corn and we didn't get either one. You know, so the market might have just walked away from that. You know, plus the same time too, big move in the equity market. So the last couple of days as well. So that might just saw a little bit of money flow go back over to those equity markets. Definitely. Thanks for joining us, John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing. We'll have more ad day coming up. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779. Ag Day is sponsored by Germinator Steel Closing Wheels. Perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order your Germinator Closing Wheels today. I got the precipitation outlook uh, between November 20th and November 24th. There's some obviously key dates in there. Now here's a look at what we have. Now we do have a, a cold front that's going to be moving up to the north and to the east as it does. Uh, the attached low pressure system with that cold front is going to deepen and work to the northeast, bringing a decent amount of rainfall uh, up and down the east coast. A blank in the middle part of the country uh, into parts of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and also into uh, Missouri before our next start next system starts to take the shape. So it's going to be mainly snow in and across the higher elevations into the mountain areas. You factor in what's going on regarding our temperatures and uh, this past week it's all been about the warmth. Next week we flip it all back over. So the temperature outlook between the 20th and the 24th and back down below average for a good portion of the United States nearly two thirds of the United States. But as we've talked about before, anytime you're looking at these kind of maps, what you want to focus on uh, are the max and the min. So the max area of cold air, or at least the area that could be impacted by that cold air, is mainly in the Midwest. And then we start to see an area of high pressure or ridge developing on the West Coast. So what we're continuing to see is that pattern uh, moving along and across the United States. So the possibility is there to get a ridge building back in. Uh, across two thirds of the United States once we get out of the Thanksgiving weekend. Being said, December, especially the first couple of weeks in December, does look pretty active as we get a little bit more cold air in and across uh, the states. As for the jet stream, Saturday and into Sunday, so there's that pocket of cold air in the jet stream, ridge of high pressure uh, trying to build back in this weekend, which is going to try and warm those temperatures up back into the east as well. And watch what happens into next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, another pocket of some cooler air 
trough trying to dig down, but this is looking pretty shallow based on what's going on in the jet stream. You can certainly get a little bit more cold air behind it with this setting up on Monday and going into Thanksgiving. We'll start off with uh, Claxton, Georgia. Now, some showers high around 68 degrees. Valpo, Valparaiso, home of the beacons. Mostly sunny, high of 65, low of 53. Aspen, Colorado, mostly sunny, high of 47. Ag Day is brought to you by Tendovo Soybean Herbicide, raising the pre-emergence bar one clean row at a time. See how Tendovo delivers weed control without compromise at SyngentaUS.com backslash Tendovo. A new report says average fed cattle prices have increased 12% so far this year. Purdue University researchers saying prices increased from an average of $161 in the first quarter to $180 by the third quarter. They also say feeding costs have declined from the peak earlier this year. However, feeder steer prices have increased substantially. The researchers looking at the break-even prices from January 2013 to September of 2023 seen here in the red. Showing break-even prices have risen from $155 per hundredweight in the fourth quarter of last year to over $174 per hundredweight. Looking ahead to next year, prices are projected to range from $193 to $197 per hundredweight, potentially heading to cattle finishing losses. For the first time in 25 years, beef from Paraguay is expected to come into the U.S. USDA says APHIS conducted a risk analysis, concluding beef can be imported safely from Paraguay under certain conditions. Those imports are expected to start next month. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association putting out a news release strongly opposing the decision, seeing it has repeatedly raised concerns with USDA over Paraguay's history of foot and mouth disease and leaders worry it may pose risk to the safety of the U.S. cattle herd. Up next, making sure your morning bowl of cereal is safe. A look at the latest research being done on cereal crops at one university in the country. In Minnesota, it's not just corn and soybeans that help feed a hungry world, but it's also cereal crops like oats, wheat, and barley. And as Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan reports, researchers at the University of Minnesota are carrying on a tradition of helping to protect these crops. Walk into the cereal disease lab here at the University of Minnesota, and there's a constant focus on wheat, barley, and oats. In wheat, barley, and oats, we are here chiefly to understand how we can prevent disease for American farmers. So we look at ways that we can introduce new sources of resistance into existing germplasm that farmers are growing. Matthew Moscow says the two biggest disease threats to cereal crops today are rust and fusarium. Both hit yearly. So very often farmers will go out into the field and see small little spots initially forming on their crops. And what those turn out to be are lesions that will eventually form cereal rust, which will then erupt and then spread by wind across fields and really can travel thousands of miles. And one of the standard paths is going from Texas all the way up to Minnesota every year. So in order to breed more disease resistant crops, this lab focuses on three areas of study. One, we, we identify new sources of resistance to breed into germplasm that makes its way to plant breeders. The second part, we're studying the pathogen and looking at not only national populations of the disease, but looking at how the pathogen evolves worldwide. And the third part is to identify new approaches that we can breed resistance into our crops, new sources and new approaches that we can use to speed up the process. He says researchers at this lab have already helped identify tens to even hundreds of genes to breed into crops to make them hardier against potential diseases. So we've become really good at identifying those resistances that exist in a lot of land race and wild material that we look at. And we're speeding up that process of discovery that then will make it faster to get to farmers. For diseases that can cost agriculture anywhere between 500 million to a billion dollars a year, the goal is to improve resistance. Researchers today are standing on the shoulders of giants who set the stage for some of this work currently being done. One of the biggest, Norman Borlaug, also known as the father of the Green Revolution, who received his PhD from here. This was really a seminal period for him to understand the importance of wheat stem rust as a disease. And he brought that with him when he was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation at Simit in Mexico for breeding those crops that just had a substantial impact on the world that led to his Nobel Peace Prize. 
Vorlog's work in breeding wheat strains that resisted diseases also grew into a reputation as the man who saved a billion lives, a legacy that's still alive on campus today. We completely feel it. I mean, in fact, a lot of my research is based on some of the dreams that he has for the future, and we're trying to deliver that into the crops of today. Thanks, Ty, and that's all the time we have for this morning. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Michelle Roof. Have yourself a great day.